Today, we're diving back into season previews, taking a look at the Pacers bench guards, TJ McConnell, Aaron Neesmith, and Andrew Nembard, what to expect from their seasons as they try to fit in on a new look Pacers team. We'll talk about it all today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers. As always, my name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the West Side Community News. And today we're back on the season preview grind, looking at the upcoming season for every single player on the Pacers roster. If you missed Monday's episode, we started off with Jalen Smith and how this is going to work is Every starter or projected starter, as well as Chris Duarte, uh, who could be a starter, but him and Buddy Heald's a little ambiguous, will get their own individual episode. And then the bench has been broken up into three different groups of three. So the guards today, TJ McConnell, Andrew Nembard, and Aaron Neesmith will do each one of them, gets one segment, previewing their upcoming season. A couple notes here. First and foremost, yesterday's show was awesome. Brett Bauer joined me. We talked about the fits of every player on the Pacers roster in tears with Tyrese Halburn. It was really good. A lot of positive remarks from people about it. If you haven't listened to that, I would highly recommend it. Other note is how we do these shows, looking at player season previews. I like to start by looking at how basketball reference projects their stats, then talking about their role, a big question about their season, a big stat, and their importance to the Pacers this year and long term. We'll start with TJ McConnell. Very interesting season coming up for the now 30-year-old guard, the oldest Pacer on the team, which is pretty crazy when he joined the team as a spunky 27-year-old a few years ago with only four years of NBA experience. And his stats are interesting as Basketball Reference projects them. 12.6 points per 36 is their projection. That would be the highest of his career, tied with last year, really. Um, Interesting to note that, and we'll talk about his role in a second. 8.1 assists per 36 is their projection for his assists. That would be one of the higher numbers of his career as well. He's had four seasons above that. He finished lower than that last year, but missed a lot of time and only played in three games to close the season. None of the rest of the numbers really are super important with him. You know, they have him at, at a little higher shooting percentages than I'd expect. But his role is very fascinating because he'll be on a second unit, at least if, if things break the way it looks like with, with the minutes and the rotation, with not a lot of creators, right? The second unit will be McConnell and then, you know, one of Kiel, Duarte, Neesmith, whatever. And, and those guys can create a little bit, but not a ton. And then, you know, O'Shea Brissett, Kendall Brown, maybe Neesmith at the three, you know, Not a lot of Jalen Smith, Isaiah Jackson, whoever is there, not a lot of shot creation. I think he'll get a lot of assists because he'll be asked to get in the paint, kind of move guys around and make stuff happen with that group. And so I would project that his per 36 assist numbers are a little higher by the end of the season than basketball reference says, but his scoring's a little down. And I bet the percentages are a little down from their projections as well. His shots will be tougher as there'll be a lot of self-created stuff, not playing with, you know, some of the creators he's had next to him in past seasons with the Pacers, whoever that may have been, Aaron Holiday, for example, Malcolm Brogdon, whatever, those guys will not be playing with him as often as in past seasons. And his steal numbers, I think, will go up a little as he'll be asked to be pesky on the ball. His role will be interesting this season as well, right? I penciled him in when I broke this down as backup point guard, but I think he could be demoted at some point where they decide to go with Nembard and McConnell as the backup will be a storyline to monitor this season. I think McConnell will have the reins for most of the season. You know, this kind of goes back to the Aaron Holiday, TJ McConnell discussion a few years ago. But back then, the Pacers were trying to win, and McConnell was more helpful for winning. Aaron Holiday was the development project who was wildly inconsistent. How do they value that now with McConnell being 30 and a big investment in Andrew Nembard? I don't know. But the trouble with point guard specifically is, we'll talk about this with Nembard in segment three, it's harder to have him be a guy you you really develop and give a lot of reins to because a struggling point guard also makes it harder for the rest of the guys to get their reps, to be in the right spot and develop in a way that with a more veteran leader and ball handler makes more sense. So it's a lot harder to just throw Nembard in in those exact same situations. So I think you'll see a lot of TJ McConnell as the backup this season with a chance for at some point being demoted behind Nembard just for development reasons, not for talent reasons. Maybe he gets traded at some point too because, again, he's the oldest pacer on a young developing team. But I think it's more likely the discussions about his role change and a demotion would come next offseason or very, very late in this coming season. What's the biggest question about T.J. McConnell's season? Which T.J. McConnell do we see? Not to say he was not as good last year, but, you know, field goal percentage for McConnell last year, 48%. 
Lowest since 2016-17, right? He tried to add the three. Wasn't really a thing for him. The steals were down. The assists were below five for the first time, for only the third time of his career. First time since 2018, right? A lot of stuff that was a little worse, right? And he had that really crazy stretch, five games in early November, where he was like one of the best pacers. They won four out of six on the back of him scoring a bunch and being a beast and having that crazy 10 and 10 double doubled to beat the Spurs and really get their season going again. You know, can he be more of the Bjorker and McConnell and that McConnell who was really a driver for the second unit and was getting to that fadeaway in the mid post that he's really good at and, and setting guys up, or will he more struggle to get involved in the Rick Carlisle system like he did at times this past season, just going off of his shooting splits, for example, you know, that, that by distance stuff, that 10 to 16 footer that he was so money on even a little closer in, right? Under Nate Bjorkren, 65% from zero to three feet, 55% from three to 10 feet and 55% again from 10 to 16 feet. Last year under Carlisle, 56% at the rim, 57% from three to 10 feet to about the same, and then 42% from 10 to 16. So those those percentages of makes dropped off and the percentages of his shot attempted in those ranges went down for all of those distances. He transitioned quite a bit to long twos and threes. You know, Can he go back to being a little bit closer to the player he was two seasons ago is, I think, a big question about his season. Can he get to that shot in the mid post a little more? Can he get into the teeth drive, be that effective player that went away a little bit? At times, and I think that's why one of the biggest stats to monitor for him is that drive number, right? Can he get it up to about, I think it was nine almost per game in in 26 minutes two seasons ago? Can he get back up to those numbers where he's really penetrating all the time? He's getting around. He's making the defense move. And what makes McConnell so slithery is, you know, he's not an awesome finisher. You're not trying to get him in with the trees all the time. But he doesn't need a screen necessarily to make the defense scramble all the time. You know, those sort of paint touches are why he's valuable. Can he keep that number up? And the other one would be, does he add any sort of three that would make him available to play a little more with Tyrese? Uh, not looking like a 30-year-old is just going to add that, but he has been working on it, tweaking his form a little bit. It didn't help a ton last year, but if he can add that to his drives, I think that would be big for the projection of his season. How important is TJ McConnell's success to the team this year? Well, look, every point guard is important to the success of a team. I have a longstanding theory that I've talked about on the show for forever that Good quality point guard play is usually the biggest factor, ball handling play or point guard play, the biggest factor in a team jumping from bad to good or good to great or great to amazing or whatever. Teams exceeding expectations usually have a guy with the ball a lot who is playing a lot better than people thought. Hey, most improved player last year was John Morant and the Grizzlies ascended to the two seed. Devin Booker finally put it all together in the bubble. The Suns became the Suns we know now. Victor Oladipo is better than everybody thought. Hey, the Pacers are suddenly pushing LeBron to seven games. Hey, Darius Garland ascends. The Cavs are good. You could go on and on. And obviously, players getting better means their team gets better. But it always, it's almost always a ball handler. You know, it's not like if Miles Turner takes a huge jump this year, the Pacers will be way better. They'll be better because he'll be better. But I don't think that would have as big of an impact as guards. All that to say, TJ McConnell would be important to the success of the Pacers in that he will run the second unit. He will make a lot of players seasons better or worse and his own season better or worse based on his own play he will drive an offense under a smart offensive minded coach that is always important yes I think he has a solid level of impact on the success of this team as much as he could have in a small role the thing is I don't think more than 15 to 20 minutes a game will make sense for him it seems like playing Tyrese Halbert in 32 minutes a night ish should be a goal for this this organization at minimum and that does not leave a lot of room for McConnell to squeak in there unless they're trying to get two to five minutes of both of those guys together. And then you can get McConnell to maybe 20 minutes pretty easily, but then you're sacrificing someone else. So it's hard to get him a ton of minutes. So not drastically important to the success of the Pacers. They'll have other point guards they can play, but still as important as any point guard can be. And the last question I ask with all these players, something I haven't had to do on season previews before, but as the Pacers are more developing long-term mode, is TJ McConnell angling for a spot on the Pacers long-term? Where is his long-term sitting with the team? No, he is not. <laughs> I don't know that McConnell even makes it to the end of this contract a member of the Pacers. Maybe he does. It just seems like, given the age range of players they've identified, you know, they now have a dozen 25 or younger players on this team that doesn't even count 26-year-old Miles Turner. A 30-year-old doesn't seem to be in their long-term plans, and he's a great vet, one of the best vets. There's a reason he hasn't popped up in any of the trade rumors the Pacers have been involved in this summer. Because he does have value to their team, both from his position, his skills, and his ability to be kind of a veteran leader coach type. 
but he's not necessarily fighting for a long-term spot on this team, both because Tyrese Halliburton is already on the Pacers and because there's a young point guard sneaking up trying to take his minutes who they just picked 31st and Andrew Nembard. So, of course, I'm looking forward to watching TJ McConnell, one of those pesky fun players that people enjoy watching, but every fan of other teams hates. <laughs> so it'll be fun to see how many moments he can have like that again. Let's pivot to a more wing guard type. Uh, I had to decide in the forwards and guards who would be in the guard group. And Aaron Neesmith was the best fit. He does play or has played some guard, you could say, uh, with Boston in the past. So let's preview the upcoming season for one of the new Pacers, Aaron Neesmith. Before we do that, though, I'd like to very quickly talk to you guys about Bilt Bar. I talked to you a lot about Bilt Bar this week because they are making the best tasting protein bars ever. They're 100% covered in chocolate, soft, delicious, easy to chew protein bars that actually taste great. They taste like candy bars. A lot of the ones you buy in the stores, not very good, not good texture. They're rubbery. They don't taste like they say they're going to taste. Whereas Bilt Bar, chocolate covered. Uh, their new flavor is cookie dough chunk puff. So it's got little cookie dough chunks on the top that taste like a candy bar. Like I said, it's got a marshmallow infusion in those puff things. So it's delicious. It's absolutely delicious. Tastes exactly like the flavor says. And all Bilt Bars are healthy. The cookie dough chunk puff, for example, 160 calories and 15 grams of protein. And it's collagen protein that your body absorbs faster. They have a ton of other awesome flavors. My favorite's the peanut butter brownie. They have some fruit infusion ones. They have some nut infusion ones. You've got to try them yourself. Go to built.com, B-U-I-L-T. Use the promo code LOCKEDON15 when you're checking out for 15% off your order. You will not be disappointed. That promo code, again, is LOCKEDON15 for 15% off at built.com. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, Locked On 76ers, TJ McConnell's former team and the most recent team to make at least a somewhat sizable impact signing in Montrez Harrell. Big addition is the backup center behind Joel Embiid. They'll have it all over on Locked On 76ers for you. Let's move on to a non-point guard before we go back to a point guard to close out the show. Aaron Neesmith's upcoming season, one of the more interesting seasons of any player on the team to me. Which is weird to say because he might not even have a role if he has a terrible first 15 games. But because he's kind of a flyer, because he was included in a big trade, he's young, he could be a wing, he has a lot of intrigue to me on this Pacers team. When I built the Pacers rotation, he was the last guy I found minutes for about 15 minutes per game. I ended up with him about 11, really, when it was all said and done. But I'll be interested to see how the Pacers can get him in there. So what do his stats project per 36 on basketball reference? Well, I'm going to jump around and do a different stats for him than I have with other players because the biggest one to me is that three-point percentage. Basketball reference puts him at 31.7%. That would not be good. The Pacers would like to see that number be much higher than that. 37% as a rookie on 108 attempts, 27% last year on about 115 attempts, roughly equivalent attempt numbers, right? So who is Aaron Neesmith, right? TBD on the player he is. He's, he hasn't even played in 100 games yet. He's only played 1,200 minutes, right? It's hard to know who he is, but if he's closer to the rookie year shooter, that's a big deal. If he's closer to the sophomore year shooter, that's also a big deal. And if he lands right kind of in the middle at this 32% number that basketball reference is projecting, he'll have to be a good defender to stick in the NBA to get opportunities. Because that number is not, frankly, high enough for him, given his lack of offensive repertoire elsewhere, right? They only have 43% field goal percentage projected for him. He's about 42% for his career. That makes sense. But going through the same shooting chart we just talked about with McConnell, you know, Neesmith did well at the rim last year. He's kind of bouncy, but not a good mid-range finisher. And a lot of that, a lot of that is assisted. Every single three he made as a rookie was assisted. Last year, 80% of his twos were assisted and 94% of, of his threes were, right? Not a big self-creator. So if the three's not there, his offensive package is a little limited and reliant on other players. You know, that number is one to watch as you go through his projections. 13 points per 36, 6.3 boards, pretty low in all the rest of the spots. You know, that, thir that point number would be higher than he's ever had in his career. And I think he'll have a chance to have more opportunities with the Pacers. That makes sense in the rebounds also. Makes sense. He is pretty springy and bouncy and athletic for his size. So I think those all about make sense to me. Uh, the, the points and rebounds and really all of the per 36 numbers for him make sense given his career averages and given what I think his role will be. It's the percentages that don't make sense because, I mean, I suppose it's possible he's just the average of his last two seasons as a shooter, but it seems like in a different role and in a, in a dynamic career where his shot form develops and his ability to play develops, you know, it's, it's more likely to me, this sounds ridiculous because I'm a math guy who thinks averages make sense, 
it seems more likely to be he is one or the other. <laughs> He's either a good shooter who had a bad sophomore year or a bad shooter who had a hot start to his rookie career. And, you know, look no further than TJ Leaf, who ended up on the wrong extreme for the Pacers. And I know Pacers fans kind of reflex at the name, but remember, like started off awesome. 43% as a rookie from downtown. That was what he was in college, sort of similar to Neesmith. And it just went away as he sort of developed and never found a role. And the shot got flatter. If you saw Neesmith at Summer League, flat shot, right? Can he get out of the slump he was in last year? TJ Lee finished with a 26% and 28% seasons from three. We'll see where Aaron Neesmith fits into the mix as a shooter. What will his role be? I currently pe- pegged him in as you know kind of a backup reserve wing guard. Maybe he plays some two. Maybe he plays some three. doesn't matter what position it actually is. You know, he's just on the floor. Uh, I think he'll start the season getting some minutes every game, but where that ends up, TBD, right? If he plays well and, and earns that minutes, I think he could keep that role all season, perhaps even get more if, say, a Buddy Heald trade happens or there's an injury ahead of him or something like that, or even Matherin struggles as a rookie. Maybe there's a way Neesmith gets a few more minutes because he is only 22, right? He's not that much older than Benedict Matherin now. You need to give Aaron Neesmith minutes. You need to give Aaron Neesmith minutes. We'll see, but I think it's more likely that he struggles and could get demoted out of that role completely and just not play at all. That'd be one way to give Andrew Membard, for example, spot minutes or Kendall Brown or something like that. So I think Neesmith will get a chance to prove what he can be. That's why I pegged him in the early season rotation with, again, somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes, probably the last guy, the lowest minutes of anyone in the rotation to open the season. But, you know, Terry Taylor, Kendall Brown, Nembard, guys who will be right outside fighting for some of those spots. He'll have to play well to keep playing or hope for a trade if you would like a lot of minutes. Biggest question about Aaron needs to be the season. It's very vague, but this is kind of true of every young wing. Is he actually a good shooter or actually a good defender, right? And, and that's so broad. But, you know, I've talked about this. I talked about this with Rhett Bauer yesterday, and I've said this on a lot of shows. If you're a wing who can either shoot threes or defend one or the other, you can play in the NBA. Doug McDermott, horrible defender. Elite shooter, great, has a role, gets $40 million to have a role on a, on, a, on a team, right? Joe Harris, similar situation. And the flip side is also true, right? If you're an awesome defensive wing, but you can't shoot for crap, guess what? There's still a role for you. Andre Iguodala puts his hand up and, and knows that very well. The Heat have a bunch of those guys. You know, if you can do one or the other at that wing size, you can play. Can Neesmith do either? I think he's got a chance to be an average defender on the wing. His size prevents him from guarding the best of the best, but it looks like, at least it projects to me, that he could be an okay defender. Is he actually? You know, TBD on that. And same with the three, right? Awesome rookie year. Looks like something he can do. That sort of went away his second season. What is he as a shooter? If he can shoot, he can also play. He could be Doug McDermott. And his defensive rating, it was on offs with the Celtics. They had a better D rating with him on than off. And that's one of the best defensive teams in the league. You know, the team defense is there. Is that stuff real? Does it translate to a young team in a new ecosystem? If so, I think it's more likely to go back to something we just said, that he's playing every game and getting decent minutes. If not, TBD. And his most important stats to monitor, both of those kind of things go hand in hand with what I just said. Defensive rating uh, is not a, an individual stat. It's not Aaron Neesmith's stat, but you know more so his on-off, right? Do they defend well with him in there? Can he be an impactful wing defender for this team? And really, are they a good defensive team with him out there? Or is he holding them back in that way? Really, just his defensive advanced stats in general. And watching his defense is not a stat. But his defense in general is a stat to monitor. Uh, And then three-point percentage is obviously the other one. And I just put, as as a little note after those two stats, can he show another skill? Does Aaron Neesmith come in this year? Like, I just mentioned this earlier. He shot 80 7% 7% at the rim last year for the Celtics. It was only 13% of his shots, and he only attempted, you know, 182 shots. We're only talking about 25 shots maybe at the rim, but he made a ton of them, right? Is that a real thing? Could he be a cutting finisher at the rim? That would be a, a huge addition to his game. That would make him maybe closer to O'Shea Brissett's level of impact. Can he add a one dribble move, right, like Buddy Heald did when he came to the Pacers? He added an extra dribble to a lot of his attacks. Are these things that Aaron Neesmith can add? Those are sort of stats, and, and they'll show up as stats, but that's sort of, again, like defense, a big-picture thing to monitor for him. So how's important, how important is Aaron Neesmith the success of the Pacers this year? Nah. I mean, if he's the player he's shown the first two years of his career, eh, wings are important, I guess, but not really. I mean, if, if he's the guy playing the least minutes of anyone in the rotation, not mega important to their success or failures this season. His development is important. But if he's way better than expected, yeah, he'll be important to their success as one of their better wings in that case. But 
seems like more likely that he's just like, eh, you know, a guy that helps them win games every so often, but is more so, you know, a part of things developing to try to be better than that. But is he angling for a spot on the Pacers long term in that development? Absolutely. Absolutely. You could argue he was their wing acquisition of the offseason. Wings are mega valuable in the NBA these days. If needs miss any good, that Brogdon trade is going to look way better. He'll be a nightly player for them if he can be a wing who can show that he belongs on this Pacers team. He's absolutely angling for a spot on this team. His fourth-year option is still floating out there as a decision the Pacers have to make this summer. I think they'll pick it up. It makes the most sense, but you never know. We don't know what they're thinking, and perhaps they even go into the season still evaluating him in that way. He's got to fight for some stuff on this team because it's kind of TBD on what kind of player he will be. One more bench guard I want to talk about and preview their upcoming season today, and that's Andrew Nembard, the 31st overall pick. It's going to be fascinating to see what his season is. Turns out to be, let's talk about the young, tall backup point guard. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, how about Aaron Neesmith's old team? Locked On Celtics is the way to go there. And hey, they're in the news again because after Danilo Gallinari's injury in Eurobasket, maybe they're Carmelo Anthony's next team. John Corrales has more on that over at Locked On Celtics. Let's talk about Andrew Nembard. Very fascinating upcoming season to me. Just something I was thinking about today, living my life, because I think about the Pacers too much because it's my job. But anywho, Andrew Denbard got picked 31st, and I always think that's an interesting draft slot because when you think about a player drafted 31st, right, if they're picked one pick higher, they're picked 30, they're a first rounder, and then you discuss them as, this guy got picked in the first round. And then if you're the Pacers and you're a young developing team, you say, well, he's a first rounder. You got to try to find him a role, right? But because he got picked 31st, one pick later, you, you, you know, the Pacers aren't going to be a team that are, are really trying to get him out there. They're going to play McConnell more. And I, I said in the first segment, I think they will play McConnell more because point guard's an important position. But it's crazy how one pick slot changes the perception of what's important. But let's go through the history of the 31st pick, right? Isaiah Todd last year didn't play very much. Doesn't look like projecting to be a solid player. Two years ago, Tyrell Terry didn't play very much. Doesn't look like he's projecting to be a solid player. Three years ago, Nick Claxton. Guess what? Nicholas Claxton played during his rookie season. And and lo and behold, he's turned out to be a rotation quality player who the Nets kind of need. You know, he didn't play a ton his rookie year. I guess I shouldn't say a ton. But the the games he did play, he got minutes. And, And then that developed. Morris the season went on. Elliot Kobo the year before didn't play. Frank Jackson did play. He's still in the league. You know, the Chetty Osman got minutes and played. Deonta Davis the year later did not. All this to say, this is all over the place. I apologize for that. But, you know, it, it seems like these 31st picks who are given minutes end up a little better. And that's obvious. You, know, you want your rookies to play. You know, Alan Crabb, for example, another one. But it's going to be hard with Nembard, right? One pick changes the perception of what he can be this season. It's really hard to project his stats. Basketball reference doesn't do rookies for this exercise. So I'd just be guessing. But I think a a stat I will guess at is how many games does he play in, right? Uh, I think that's an interesting thing to talk about because, you know, does he end up sneaking in as as the backup point guard this season? You know, things like that uh, I think are going to be key things to kind of to kind of monitor. How many games does he end up playing in? If you look back at last year's Pacers, for example, you know, some of their younger players down uh, n- you know, near the bottom of their roster, you know, weren't playing in a ton of games. Like uh, Dwayne Washington played 48. That was a lot for a rookie, but you know, like Terry Taylor was at 33. You know, they didn't have a ton of games for these younger players. I think Andrew Nembard's stat to watch as you kind of peg what his season will look like is can, can he get to 25 to 30 games played? And, and he'll play in all the blowouts for sure in garbage time and things like that. But can that number get to, you know, 40 if he plays well or if, Someone gets injured ahead of him because his future is fascinating. How much can they invest in him given what their team is, given what position he plays, given who they have at that spot? Just because looking at the history of pick 31, you know, there is value in investing minutes in that spot, but it's going to be tough. Uh, but that that's my filler to talk about instead of talking about his projected stats because there aren't any. Uh, and I cannot fault basketball reference for not projecting stats for players who have never played an NBA game. What does Andrew Nembard's role project to be this year? The opposite of McConnell's, right? I think McConnell will start the year as the backup point guard who at some point could be demoted out of that role. Nambard, I think, will start as the third point guard who kind of plays like Brad Wanamaker last season, for example. Not very often, only when called upon. Wanamaker finished playing in 22 games after Brogdon got hurt, even Levert for a little bit. He was their emergency point guard. Kiefer Sykes 
became that role. He played in 32 games. You know, I think Nembard could sniff about those sort of numbers, and obviously those two players didn't overlap. But you know, he, he could get promoted if he plays well. I liked his game in summer league. I'm one of the only ones who did. I like the way he can, you know, get in the lane and create, and I like the way he plays his own pace. And he's tall for a point guard, so we can see some extra passing lanes. You know, I believe he can be a good player in the future, but typically rookie point guards not very good players. It'll be interesting to see if he can earn that promotion and earn the backup point guard role as the season progresses because it's hard to say what he's going to be with his skill set on this Pacers team. Is he fast enough to get paint touches and really bend defenses? Is he tall enough or a good enough shooter to be an off-ball player? These are all questions to ask about his season and stuff that I'll talk about uh, now because (laughs) the biggest question about his season is, is he good? How does he look when he plays? I mean, that's so reductive, obviously, but hey, guess what my question is going to be for Benedict Matherin and Kendall Brown? What do they look like when they play? Are they any good, right? And, and you can't write off or exclaim hooray for rookies if they're good or bad in year one. You got to give them, especially in a, on a developing Pacers team, at least three years. But that's the big question for Andrew Nembard's season. Is he good? <laughs> Does he have NBA skills? And to go back to last year, looking at emergency point guards, you know, obviously Brad Wanamaker at 32 and Keeper Sykes at 28 are different. They're more in the veteran camp age-wise, not experience-wise, but age-wise. But, you know, they both struggled with something. Keeper Sykes and Brad Wanamaker, one of their big things was neither of them could get into the lane. And both of them projected to be good shooters and weren't good shooters, right? Can Nembard either get into the lane or shoot? One or the other, bang. All of a sudden, you can get him out there, try to find roles for him to develop. And can he defend? He's tall, right? He's close to like Jeremy Lamb's height, right? As a point guard, that's pretty valuable. Lamb could get a one dribble pull up from the elbow at will. Can Nembard add that sort of stuff into his game? At his height, these are a lot of the questions you'll be asking for rookies if, if he can get out there a lot and play, which I think is very possible. So the stats I'll be monitoring, look, that was one of them. It's going to be the, the obvious one, three-point percentage, assists, things like that. But I'll call on a TJ McConnell stat first and foremost, drives. And, and the way NBA tracks drives is how far you actually get. You know, If you only dribble past the guy one dribble and then reset, they don't count that as a drive. right? Can Andrew Nembard, this is the stat that the Pacers kind of use, Paint touches. Can he be a guy who gets paint touches, especially without a screen? Can he be a creator who bends a defense, who makes stuff happen with the ball in his hands without requiring a screen? Not that a screen is bad. In fact, a lot of times a screen can be good. It adds an extra defender for the defense to focus on while they're rotating and adjusting. But even then, are his drives in the pick and roll effective? How high do those numbers go? What are the efficiency numbers in those drives? I'll be curious what that looks like. A couple other stats I'll be interested in for him this year. Turnovers, obviously. That was a problem for him in summer league. Can he tone that down? Can he find the right aggression to make those tight passes he likes to make in the lane? As a rookie, you know, you don't get overly concerned if there's a lot of turnovers. You're still learning the new speed of the game, things like that. But obviously lower would be better and project well for his career. And for a lot of players who end up being role players, something that takes them from a good role player to a great role player is they cut down the turnovers. They cut down the possessions they waste, and they're just mostly doing the good thing. McDermott, for example, with the Pacers, really cut down his turnover rate when he went to the Pacers and sort of settled into the correct role for Doug McDermott, right? As he came to the Pacers in 2018-19, his turnover rate dropped all the way down to 6.8% in his second year, 84 the year before. The, on prior teams, it was 9.3, 13, for example. You know, he got that down and was a really actualized and effective offensive player. Andrew Nembard's not a wing, but that still matters. Can he keep that turnover number down? And the last stat or thing I'll be watching, defense – in general, obviously, but defensive assignment. Does he draw matchups of, of shooting guards? He's 6'5", right? Well, 6'5 is his listed height. I bet he's closer to 6'4". Either way, that's tall enough, knock on wood, that he could guard twos. And that means you could get two playmakers of Halliburton and him together. That would allow the Pacers more ways to get him on the floor, get him minutes, and find a way to play him. You know, I thought his fit with Halliburton right now, especially, is pretty bad if you go back to yesterday's podcast. But if you can guard twos, that fit does look better because then you can play them at least defensively, effectively, and find a way to get Andrew Nembard on the floor. How important is Andrew Nembard to the success of the Pacers this year? Pretty much not at all. I mean, unless he's like one of the best second-round picks ever, it's very unlikely a third-point guard on any team, even veteran ones, are, are substantially impactful to the success of a team. They can be detrimental like Brad Wanamaker was last year at times. But, you know, it's very unlikely a third point guard has a huge impact on a team's success level this season. What would define success more for Andrew Nembard this year and the Pacers is his development. Does he get better? Is he set up to be a backup point guard in future seasons? But is he angling for a spot on the Pacers in the future? Kind of, kind of. 
Uh, I would say that he's angling for minutes on the Pacers in the future, but not a spot on the team. They gave him a long deal for a reason. Three years. Three years is a lot for second-round picks already. And then $8.4 million, the most ever for a second-round pick. They clearly like him. Rick Carlisle likes developing these point guards. You know, Eventually, it seems like they'll give him a chance. I don't think he's fighting for an eventual chance. I do think he's fighting to prove he can be the backup behind Tyrese or that he can play with Tyrese, with Benedict Matherin, with Chris Duarte, whoever the Pacers put him out there with. He's got to prove he can play with those guys. And so eventually, yes, he'll be fighting for a spot in the rotation and on a young Pacers team. But right now, I think he's mostly just about development. He'll be around for as long as the Pacers will have him or don't need to include him in trades. Let me know if you think I missed something big with any of these three players. If you're on YouTube, in the comments below or on Twitter, I'm at T East NBA. This show is at Locked on Pacers. Tomorrow, we'll get to an individual player and dive in. We'll talk about Chris Duarte's upcoming second season. Very interesting season coming up for the Dominican forward. And I don't want to do two episodes in a row of player previews. Uh, me going on vacation this past weekend sort of made it. So this week and next week, it'll end up that way. But it should stop after that where it's, alternating between player preview and then a general zoomed out topic. So for example, next week we'll be talking about a lot of things, you know, FIBA action going on, the new TV deal, 2K ratings, Eurobasket, NBA expansion maybe on the horizon, plus awards preview, standings previews, lots of fun topics coming up here on Lockdown Pacers that you won't want to miss. But tomorrow's all about Chris Duarte. So stick tuned for that. Hope everybody had a great day and we will see you soon.